I'm talking about the sky and the universe. That's Abraham, by the way, from an early 20th century Bible, uh, being quite understandably surprised by the sky. Uh, born in fury and surprise 13.7 billion years ago, if the universe isn't applied brilliance, uh, it's really hard to know what is. The uh, universe, of course, is an inquiry of astronomy. Uh, astronomy, uh, it turns out, is the only science uh, that the Romans personified with a Greek muse. Uh, her name was Urania, which means heavenly, and she was actually depicted with a celestial globe and uh, uh, measuring compass. These symbols of her jurisdiction uh, link her with observation and with measurement. Uh, and it, it's kind of a surprise that astronomy merited a muse, but, but here's why. Uh, most of the muses presided over endeavors that today would be classified as performing arts. Uh, and the ancients attributed uh, to the nine muses the power to inspire creative impulse in those engaged in what they called metrical pursuits. Uh, to the ancients, uh, the cyclical movement of the stars and the planets qualified astronomy as a metrical pursuit. And so monitoring the rhythms of heaven and the music of the spheres, uh, astronomy then kept company with theater and music and, and poetry and dance. This seems like a, uh, a bit of a surprise, but in, in fact, uh, the depictions uh, this way continue through history. And in fact, uh, uh, right up to the present time, uh, this is a rather surprising version of Urania, but uh, nonetheless, people are preoccupied with her. Uh, harmonious, repetitive, and uh, predictable celestial movement uh, then allied astronomy uh, with music and, and other metrical arts. And our ancient ancestors, uh, relying only on their eyes, uh, saw structure and regularity and rhythm and predictability in the sky. After all, the sun sets the pace of the day, delivers the years, uh, the stars accompany uh, the seasons and, and transport the hours of the night. Uh, the moon uh, goes, uh, uh, through uh, disrobing and, and blanketing itself again in progressive darkness as it calendars the months and the planets uh, wander uh, independently but with uh, ordered itineraries of their own. And of course the whole world is driven by the seasons. And, and the seasons seemed driven by uh, the travels of the sun, the reappearance of familiar stars, and, and the moon's monthly counts. And so what the ancients saw in the sky was orderly and predictable and most of the time not very surprising. Uh, in antiquity, uh, order really did rule the sky, but now and then chaos could intrude uh, and actually deliver an occasional surprise. So without warning, uh, meteors would uh, flash uh, surprise narrations through the night. Comets uh, would arrive uh, without invitation and, and depart without permission. Uh, the sun and the moon could be swallowed in, in the darkness uh, of eclipse. And most of these unusual events were regarded as calamities. Uh, or at least as, as, as omens. Uh, all of them were departures from the normal rhythm of the sky. They disrupt the regular pattern. And although vulnerable uh, to these threats, the world's order always was restored. Uh, to our ancient ancestors, the stars, uh, the planets, uh, the sun and the moon uh, were gods who brought uh, this, this order and, and light that sustained their lives. When people looked out at the sky, uh, they, they thought they observed it, of course, from the center of the cosmos, uh, a rock-solid, uh, unmoving Earth. And, and that's, of course, how things looked. Uh, that's how things felt. Uh, there was really no reason to think otherwise. But four centuries ago, people got a surprise. Right at this time of year, uh, in uh, 401 years ago, uh, in 1609, the Italian scientist Galileo became an astronomer when he turned the telescope he'd made uh, onto the moon. Uh, he was, um, it was the first thing that he actually uh, observed in the sky, and, and what he saw was a surprise. Uh, mountains and craters and, and plains, uh, these, these features told them that the moon was another world. Uh, to our prehistoric ancestors, the moon had been a, a, a rhythmic mystery that bundled the days in, in cycles of growth and decay and, and birth and decline. Uh, it was an uncanny but reliable light in the sky and, in fact, a celestial god. For the Greeks and the Romans, it was not only a god, it, it was a place, but, but not a place we know. It was a supernatural realm. It, it was a kingdom of souls, a, a gateway to the beyond. But when Galileo looked at the moon through a telescope, the moon became a world, and we would never, ever look at it the same way again. 
Galileo uh, saw the moon as he wrote, quote, uneven, uh, rough, uh, full of cavities and prominences. The moon was, in fact, something like the Earth. Uh, from night to night, he observed the lighting changes across the rough lunar ground, and he realized the effect was like sunrise on the Earth, where, where mountaintops blaze uh, with dawn while the, the shadowed valleys are waiting their turn. And Galileo's telescope revealed one wonder after another. He saw Venus uh, go through phases like the moon. That's the moon in the foreground. That's Venus uh, out beyond it. Uh, he saw stars that the eyes cannot detect. He saw and he charted four unexpected moons in orbit around Jupiter. He saw something peculiar about Saturn. He couldn't quite make it out. And, and he saw spots on the sun. So 400 years ago, the telescope actually changed everything. Uh, it, it disrupted presumption and habit. Science, technology, engineering, and culture were, were not just touched by the telescope. They were revolutionized by the telescope. And Galileo handed out telescopes to the influential. And he promoted the telescope's astronomical use. He became an astronomical celebrity, uh, got his book out in a matter of four months, and, and it sold out in a couple of weeks. Scholars and royalty, poets and artists, uh, musicians, everyone was interested in, in what he had seen. It took time, though, to adjust to a new cosmos that was leveraged by Galileo's discoveries. Uh, to Galileo, Jupiter's moons and the phases of Venus favored a, a sun-centered system, uh, a moving Earth. His observations made some authorities uncomfortable. Uh, some doubted the validity of the telescope's uh, revelation. Some just refused to look. Uh, and it all caught up with Galileo. He was tried and, and forced to admit uh, that he'd been mistaken about the Earth's motion. Uh, and the consequences of the telescope's new universe then, at least at the time, were just a little too unsettling, a little too surprising uh, for people to absorb. Eventually, however, we all got used to it. Uh, <laughs> The, these surprises all eventually made sense. And now, when, when things make a kind of sense, uh, we get comfortable again. But inevitably, inevitably we're propelled by the driving action of the cosmos into a maelstrom of grander uncertainty, uh, ever drawn to see more. Uh, we devise new instruments to look more closely, uh, and uh, we observe new wonders and, and mysteries. They change the game. Uh, the cosmos we originally knew was, was overturned by the telescope, and now 400 years later, our, our heads are turned once more by another parade of discoveries. Uh, we've moved into space, uh, and everything has changed again. Orbiting instruments and observatories, robot probes on other worlds, uh, people even landing on the moon have transformed our perspective. The planets are no longer lights in the sky or even worlds in space. They are now, in fact, landscapes. Uh, other stars are no longer stars. They, in fact, are uh, solar systems with, with planets of their own. And the stars and the galaxies that we once knew from ground-based photographs uh, that seemed colorless and static, uh, they're now chromatic, dynamic places that dwarf us and saturate our imaginations with vistas, not pictures. And the entire universe universe is no longer a wilderness of galaxies. It's now a cosmic neighborhood. Uh, the night is no longer just peppered, a uh, vault peppered with stars. Uh, now, in fact, it is a realm of monumental vistas. It's inhabited by exotics, massive crowded clusters of stars and luminous nebulae, uh, giant suns and dwarfs, uh, newborn and spent, other worlds around other stars, all parading to gravity's tune in the Milky Way, black holes imprisoning light, and huge smoky fingers of dust and gas twisting and, and stretching across light years and, and pregnant with stars, and so good they even make it above the fold on major newspapers around the world. Uh, <laughs> aging stars uh, shedding their skins, and, and empty shells of exploded stars just rolling out like tsunamis, and galaxies uh, that are twisted into breathtaking spirals. These are all wonders uh, that our eyes just never uh, imagined. These are all wonders that just make us reach for more. And so our observations now uh, dock us in orbit. They, they fly us to the moon. Uh, they drive us across the plains of Mars. Uh, that We dive through Saturn's rings, drop right onto uh, Titan's methane lakes, the moon going around Saturn. Uh, we collect uh, icy pieces of comet, and we even reach out uh, for Pluto and, and gather light uh, more distant and more exotic uh, than ever seen before to reveal an expanding universe without center and without edge. And that is a surprise. 
uh, the universe is, is no longer solid ground. We, we are getting, however, the big picture. Uh, it's a booyah base of galaxies, a, a cobweb of, of threads and ribbons and clusters of clusters of galaxies, and the distant horizon of the Big Bang shown in the background radiation charted on this diagram. It is, in fact, you are looking at the ultimate structure of reality. So surprise, in, in fact, seems to be uh, the real vocation of the cosmos. Uh, returning to Galileo then, late in life, after Galileo retreated to Arcetri uh, near Florence, a portrait of him was commissioned by an ally in Paris. And one of Galileo's biographies wrote uh, that in that picture, Galileo's face turned towards soft celestial light has, quote, an air of being startled by something unexpected. Startling people with something unexpected is our fundamental work at Griffith Observatory in Los Angeles. Uh, the observatory is not a research observatory, it's a public observatory owned and operated by the city of Los Angeles, Department of Recreation and Parks. And in fact, more people have looked through that Zeiss 12 inch refractor telescope on the roof than any other telescope in the world. Uh, Griffith Observatory is filled with instruments, and we look at the place as, as the building as instrument. It's instruments that put people eyeball to the universe uh, and transform visitors uh, into observers and, in fact, surprise them every day. That young woman, by the way, is being surprised by her first view of Saturn through a telescope. Uh, and it, uh, it's understandable why she's surprised. It's always good. I'm even surprised, even though I've seen it all the time. So you've got uh, uh, this, this activity going on at the observatory, but I want to show you just three quick examples. Uh, the Gottlieb Transit Corridor is a monumental instrument integrated into the observatory's new architecture on the west side where parallel glass walls, and you can see them there, 150 feet long, 20 feet high. Uh, this instrument hosts meridian transits, that's crossings, of the sun, moon, and stars over the walled corridor. Uh, the corridor, which is uh, 10 feet wide, is bisected by a bronze meridian line. You can see it on the ground there, just extending to the north on the concrete floor. It's just a north-south line. That's all a meridian is. And the sun crosses it every day at local noon. That's what local noon is. When the sun crosses the meridian, it's local noon. At the north end of the meridian line, and you can see it down there, there's a stairway which is constructed to ascend at the angle of the north celestial pole. So if you sight on the banister at night, you're sighting on the north star. And at night, visitors then can sight along that banister and see the north star at the end. And if they watched and took a picture over a long time, you'd see the stars circling around and carrying the sky uh, around that pole, which is, of course, what causes those transits to seem to appear uh, as objects cross the north-south line. Well, at the south end, a tall and night black 2001 monolith uh, supports a stainless steel foil, uh, which is uh, attached to the top of it there. And on the ground, just north of the monolith, which you saw a moment ago, stands this massive and inscribed bronze and stainless steel meridian arc. And above it, uh, to the left in this picture, on the inside face of the glass wall on the west, is mounted a huge and heavy star chart, an ecliptic star chart that maps out the movement of the sun through the course of the year. Well, the foil attached to the monolith is equipped with a complicated and, and technically advanced and almost inexplicable device, a hole. And when the sun <laughs> transits the corridor, the light passes through the hole. And where the light falls depends on the angle that it makes with the, uh, the horizon. And of course, that changes through the course of the year. So where the sunlight hits the inscribed arc, indicates the date. The monolith and the foil permit light from the transiting sun then to, to strike the meridian arc, which you're seeing here. The sun's image, about three inches in diameter, announces the date uh, on the scale that's inscribed with months and days and the corresponding ecliptic uh, or zodiac constellation figures. And there are special emblems that also spotlight the solstices and the equinoxes uh, and major standstills of the moon. People walk inside the transit corridor. They watch all this. They can watch it from the terrace above. And the meridian instrument, of course, has ample historic precedent. Uh, but we, we did something with it that had not been done before. We linked the, the meridian arc uh, where these um, uh, marks are, and the sun uh, makes its daily uh, transit, with uh, the big star chart on the wall. As the sun's light reaches the center line, which you can see there, all those little dots, the center line of the meridian arc, it activates sensors in those dots that run the length of the arc. And they transmit a signal uh, to the giant ecliptic chart. And that signal prompts the illumination of lights. You can see it's just about to, to hit the, um, the sensors there. And then when it does, during the period that the sun is crossing over those sensors, it 
makes the chart light up where the sun is, in this case the constellation of Taurus the bull, and it also lights up the stars of Taurus the bull. Now you can't see those stars in the daytime, but the signal makes them appear on the chart. And so the, the transit corridor in this way uh, allows the invisible to become uh, visible. The instrument reveals what otherwise is out of reach. What is known to astronomers through calculation becomes obvious to visitors through observation. And this, of course, is demonstrated daily uh, at local noon by the observatory guides. Well, here's another surprise. Uh, this is the big picture. It's on the opposite side of the room, <laughs> the depths of space, the, the big wall on the far end there. Uh, this is called the big picture. It is the largest astronomical image in the world. It occupies 114 panels of porcelain enamel on steel, 152 feet long, 20 feet high. There are at least a million and a half astronomical objects recorded here. A million of them are galaxies. That is, hundreds of billions of stars in aggregates outside of our own Milky Way galaxy. Uh, the entire big picture, however, is just a sliver of sky in the constellation Virgo, but it's enlarged far beyond expectation. It is just one one thousandth of the entire sky, the amount I can cover up by holding my finger like this. And that's what Albert Einstein is doing in bronze down there on the floor, holding up his finger to show and make the point. So although the, um, the big picture looks like a giant mural, it, it's not art. It's a monumental data set. It lets visitors look right into the depths of space at eye level and observe the uh, faintest of galaxies the telescope can detect, the kind of thing you'd have to be an astronomer to do otherwise. You can walk right up to it and, and see some of these objects just inches away. Uh, alternatively, uh, you can see magnified images of parts that are out of reach through telescopes that are installed on the edge of space on the mezzanine and transform visitors into indoor astronomers. Well, the big picture displays space. The cosmic connection, on the other hand, marks time. And the cosmic <coughs> connection is also part of the observatory's <coughs> new underground expansion. It's a long, curving corridor that transports visitors the long way around the universe. As you can see, from here, uh, it is in fact uh, just really a long ribbon that visitors can walk the history of the universe because we have important events punctuated with panels that tell what happened when in the 13.7 billion year history of the universe. And as they do that and they see time marked out, they discover that the ribbon of time in billions of years is actually mapped out with celestial jewelry a collection of suns, moons, and stars, just 165 feet of celestial jewelry. And I see visitors drawn every day by the whimsy of the jewelry, reading the illustrated panels because they're in front of them. They start talking to each other, explaining to each other. They immerse themselves in the Big Bang and the microwave curtain and the first stars and the galaxies, the formation of the solar system and the appearance of life on Earth with nearly 14 billion years of accessorized time. So in, in the service of surprise, <laughs> Uh, please let me close with another tale of Galileo. In, in old age, uh, he returned, uh, uh, of course, to house arrest, uh, but he looked at the moon once more, and he had discovered two <coughs> odd motions of the moon young in his life, but near the end, he detected one more nodding motion of the moon no one had known before, and just a little more of its hidden face had been revealed, and the sky had confirmed on Galileo yet one more surprise. So our eyes had once observed the sky, the telescopes then let us look at space. Now we move through space, we observe on the fly, our eyes, our telescopes, and our spacecraft have launched us all into the universe. We've moved into space, and everything has changed again. And that is how it works. So don't get used to it. Uh, wonders never cease, and surprise really is routine in the universe. Thank you very much. <laughs>